Hey class, welcome back. We're going to discuss chapter five now, um, an introduction to forces and Newton's laws of motion. So we're really moving on to a new topic. So um, chapters one, two, and four were all about motion, equations of motion, how we describe motion um, with velocity, acceleration, position, and so on. Chapter three was vectors, which is a tool in order to go into two dimensions, and it's going to be a very useful tool with forces as we see here. Now, but the next couple chapters and really much of the rest of the semester are focused around the idea of forces and how forces affect motion. So super important topic, very instrumental for the rest of the semester as well as for statics, dynamics, and many other courses that you guys will likely be taking in your future. So let's go ahead and jump into looking at forces and Newton's laws of motion. Before we do though, we're going to talk about mass. We introduced that at the very beginning of the semester, but haven't discussed it yet. So mass is a measurement of the amount of stuff or matter that something contains. That's a typical way of defining mass. But we're going to think about mass, and I'd encourage you to start conceptualizing mass in a slightly different way now that we get into talking about forces and as we're in physics. Think about mass as really a measurement of the amount of inertia something has. What is inertia, you might ask? Well, we're going to get into that more later. But really, the inertia is the amount that something resists a change in its motion. So objects tend to resist change in motion. So for example, a more massive object like a refrigerator has a greater amount of inertia. So it has more resistance to its change in motion. It's harder to get it going and it's also harder to stop it once it is going. So be careful if you're ever moving a fridge. A smaller object like you know a calculator or something, like I have mine here, I was doing some calculations, it has much less inertia than a refrigerator. So it's much easier to get it moving and it's much easier to stop it once it starts moving because it has a lesser inertia as a result of its lesser amount of mass. So that's mass, but we wanted to get into forces. So what are forces? Well, a force is any kind of push or pull on an object. It's any kind of interaction with an object that's going to cause it to want to change direction or to potentially change its motion. Not always is it going to change its motion. You can push on a wall, apply a force, and it's not going to move. But if that wall wasn't held down, you could potentially apply enough force to cause it to move. So force is a push or a pull, something that's going to cause something to want to experience a change in motion. There's going to be two kind of general categories we're going to discuss at present. There are contact forces which are forces that arise from interaction between objects. And there's also what we call action at a distance forces, which are forces that don't require physical contact. So things like the gravity or electrical forces um, that you might have experienced at different times in your life are action at a distance. If I hold up an object and release it, it falls. The Earth's gravity pulls on it even though there's no physical contact with it. But the act of me pushing it up to lift it, that is a contact force. I'm physically touching the object and supplying it with the force. So, a couple examples. Now let's talk about different types of forces. One of my favorite types of force is the force that Yoda uses, but that's not what we're talking about here. Instead, I want to talk about different types of forces. So forces can come as either individual single forces or net forces, which is the summation of other forces. All right, we're going to deal with both. We're going to be adding up forces at different times, summing them up um, to figure out what the overall net force is. And we're going to talk about the difference between those as we go forward. But some individual types of forces we're going to deal with are things like the normal force, frictional force, tension, and weight forces. And then we'll just put kind of a general all other contact forces as well, a push, a pull, a kick, those types of things, thrust in an engine. Um, would fall under the rest of the general types of contact forces. But we're going to focus on defining those first four in more detail, and then you'll also see just generic contact forces as well. So here's a picture to kind of give you a quick summary of what you can see here. Here we see normal force. That's a force normal to a surface as a result of contact. We're going to dive into that more later. Here we can see friction force, which is that small little f. It's the resistance to a direction of motion as a result of rubbing between two surfaces. We're going to define that and deal with that a lot more in chapter six, as you'll see. 
and here we see tension force all right that's a pull all right from a rope or something like that a tension force is caused as a result of a pull within a material a lot of times a tension force can only be a pull you can't push things very well with a rope so that's a good way to remember tension and then weight force is a force due to gravity one of those action at a distance forces that we were talking about earlier all right so let's jump into these a little more in a little more detail before moving forward so first of all the normal force so the normal force it's as its name implies comes from the fact that it's a force that's always always perpendicular to the surface of contact so keep in mind it's always perpendicular to the surface of contact so you can see here i have a fancy little ramp i'm going to tilt this down so you can see my ramp here so here i have a fancy little ramp okay if i place an object like my calculator on that ramp and it doesn't slide the friction is holding it in place but the normal force is the force of the ramps pushing on the calculator it's perpendicular to the surface of the ramp let me lift this up so you guys can see it more easily. so if this is my ramp the normal force is going to be perpendicular to that if the if it's flat then the normal force is straight up if it's at an angle it's going to be perpendicular to that and even if you're holding the the uh, calculator against a flat surface, there can still be a normal force from the flat surface, which is going to be straight out. So if you lean against a wall or something, your normal force is going to be in the straight out direction. Okay, so again, that is normal force for you. Frictional force, as we talked about, is a resistance to motion parallel to a surface of contact. Again, that can be, if it's flat, then it's going to be parallel to the surface, so horizontal. But if again, if you're at an angle, like with the ramp once again, if you're at an angle of some sort, the friction force holding my calculator on here, oh, it's not holding it now, okay? The friction force holding this on here is parallel to the surface. It's up the ramp, resisting its direction of motion. Now, if I flip it around, now it's still parallel to the surface and still up the ramp okay so friction is always parallel to the surface of contact all right so again the normal force is a result of the contact between two surfaces another way to think of normal force for example here you see this block it's not falling through the table why not weight is pulling it down what's stopping it from falling through the table well the table's in the way right so that contact with the table that's in the way creates some upward force resisting the weight from pulling it down to the center of the earth that upward force that resistance caused by two objects not being able to occupy the same space is known as the normal force so here's an example for you you see a situation where you have a block with a weight of 15 newtons and you're pushing down on top of that block with a force of 11 newtons if it's not moving then the normal force from the table is not only going to support the weight, the 15 newtons, it's also going to resist your 11 newton push down. And so your overall normal force would be the sum of those two equal to 26 newtons. All right, because again, the normal force is up, your 11 newton force is down, negative. The weight is also down, negative. So solving for the normal force, it equals 26 newtons. The reason you see here that it's equal to zero, since it's not moving, its net force is zero, which will be learning about more later in this chapter here you see another example now if you were to turn around and pull up with a tension force of 11 newtons now the normal force would only be 4 newtons so what you can see here is normal force is only going to resist as much as it has to it can be anything up to zero up to some maximum before the object is about to break so it really varies depending on the circumstance here you see the exact same block experiencing a 26 newton force and then a 4 newton force based on what other forces are acting on it so that's an important thing to think about and keep in mind all right so that's a little bit about normal force another type is tension force as i mentioned that's a pulling force usually from a rope or a cord of some kind it's a type of contact force and then we have weight which weight is really the force that's a result of the acceleration due to gravity so keep in mind a lot of times people get a little confused between weight and mass but as you see here weight the weight of an object is defined as its mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity so if you wanted to find the weight 
of a 10 kilogram mass? Well, it would be 10 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 meters per second squared, so it would be 98 newtons worth of force. Newtons are the units for force, as we'll learn about here in just a little bit. So we got a few different forces on our hands. Here you can see an interesting example of tension. So tension force acts in a string, or sorry, yeah, acts in a string. So tension force a lot of times will act along the direction of a string or a rope, as you see here. So if this man pulls down on this rope, he's pulling down with a force of T in the downward direction. We're going to put a negative sign in front of it, the force of the tension. So therefore, if we assume that this is a massless rope and there's no forces generated by the pulley, then the pulley is just going to change the direction of the force. And so that same T force that he's pulling down with is pulling up on this block. And so it's the same force because the force is going to be the same at all points in the rope. If you were to bisect the rope right here and see what the force is like there, it would also have a tension force of T at that point in the middle of the rope as well. So here, just to give you an idea, I found this fun table of different types and magnitudes of forces, not types, I guess, just mostly magnitudes. So you can see the sun's gravitational force on the Earth is huge, 3.5 times 10 to the 22nd power. Here you can see the weight of a blue whale, 10 to the 6th power, a linebacker playing football, 10 to the 3rd power, um, an apple, just one newton or so, and then there's very small things as well. The electrical attraction between a proton and an electron in a hydrogen atom, 10 to the negative 8th power. The weight of a bacterium, 10 to the negative 18th. The weight of an electron, 10 to the negative 30th, and so on. You can see there's a huge range of different forces we see in the natural world, from 10 to the negative 47th to much higher than 10 to the 22nd power even. Cool. So... Forces, because they're things where we care not only about their magnitude, but also the direction in which they're pointing, are, guess what, you know it, vectors, all right? So they're vectors, and so as a result, we represent them with arrows. Here's a 5 Newton vector, here's a 15 Newton vector as well, and as I mentioned earlier, the units that we like to use for force are Newtons. So the SI unit for force are Newtons, so 1 Newton equals 1 kilogram multiplied by one meter per second squared. So those are the SI units for force. And so I want you to get used to expressing your forces in Newtons. But you'll also see at times uh, pounds, for example, is actually a unit of force as well. So resulting forces, because it's a vector, you can sum them all up to figure out the overall force acting on an object. So you'll see the word resultant force. The resultant force is referring to the vector sum, the adding up of all forces acting on a given object. So since we're dealing with vectors, again, just to remind you, you can take a vector, a force, and break it into x and y components. So if you're pulling this block here with a string as shown, the tension force that we're going to label as F in this case can be thought of as just F at some angle theta, or it can be thought of as two different forces, one in the x direction, one in the y direction, where the x direction force is f cosine theta and the y direction force is equal to f sine theta. So again, representing it with the force and the angle or representing it with the x and y components are both equally accurate ways of discussing and representing a given force. And so since we're dealing with vectors, once again, if you want to figure out the overall resultant force, sometimes represented with an R, other times represented as the sum, this Greek letter sigma here represents the summation, the adding up of all forces on an object. The sum of all the forces on an object is the resultant. It's also known as the net force. So if I ever ask you, hey, what is the net force acting on this object? I want you to tell me what is the summation, the adding up of all the forces on that object. So if you have, say, three forces, F1, 2, and 3, then the sum of all the forces acting on the object would be F1 plus F2 plus F3. So again, we're dealing with vectors. So if you had two forces F1 and F2 and you wanted to find the sum of those, the resultant, you'd have to take and add up the X components, F1X plus F2X. That would give you the X component of your resultant. And then take F1Y 
F2y, add those together to give you your resultant in the y direction, and then that would define your overall resultant of your vectors. So again, same exact thing that we did back in chapter three, and then we got to practice a little bit in chapter four, we're now gonna be doing with vectors. But now you're gonna to have to be dealing with situations where you have two, three, four, five different vectors. So it becomes increasingly important to get used to using that vector uh, component summation method that we were doing back in chapter three. So again, because we're dealing with a vector, we can break it down. This is just showing exactly what we just talked about. You can add the X components and add the Y components to figure out your overall resultant. So here's an object experiencing two forces. What's its net force? Ready, go. I'm guessing you all figured it out. It's six Newtons, oh, but that's not the whole answer. It's six Newtons to the right. Don't forget, net force, you need magnitude and direction. So it's to the right and it's a six Newton force. What about this guy? What's the net force acting on this box? Quick, calculate it, go for it, ready, go. Sometimes people might be inclined to say, oh, you know, there's three Newtons here, there's four Newtons here. Maybe you'll say seven, maybe you'll say one. And neither of those are right. The net force would be five Newtons at a 37 degree angle. How did I get five Newtons? Well, I took the X component squared, four squared is 16, added the Y component squared, three squared is nine, 16 plus nine, 25, takes the, take the square root of that, and that gives you five Newtons, your hypotenuse of that triangle, and then just using a trig function to find the 37 degree angle. So again, that's finding the net force. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is introduce Newton's three laws of motion. So Newton's first law of motion simply states that an object at rest tends to stay at rest and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So what Newton's first law of motion really says is that objects with mass have inertia. As we mentioned earlier, that inertia is the tendency of something to continue with the kind of motion it has. Oops, sorry is the tendency for an object to continue with the kind of motion it has. So a more proper stating of Newton's law states that a body acted on by zero net force moves with constant velocity and zero acceleration. Keep in mind that constant velocity could be zero. Also keep in mind that this really goes both ways. If an object is moving at a constant velocity, then its net force is indeed zero. It's a common, common thing that confuses people. If you're cruising down the road at 60 miles an hour with your foot on the accelerator and staying at a constant 60 miles an hour, guess what your net force is? Your net force, you guessed it, zero. Because you're at a constant velocity, your net force is zero. That doesn't mean that there's no forces acting on you. You're pushing the accelerator, the engine is giving you forward thrust, but there's also air resistance and other things working against you. And the summation of all of those forces the net force is zero. So keep that in mind. A common thing that people miss is that your acceleration is zero and your net force is zero if you're moving at a constant velocity. All right, so that's Newton's first law of motion. The second law of motion is going to talk about acceleration. And what it tells us is that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on that object. More specifically, Newton's second law tells us that the acceleration of an object, which is directly proportional to its net force, is also inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Putting that in layman's terms, in one simple equation, as we see here, a very beautiful and powerful equation, tells us that the net force, the summation of all forces acting on an object, is simply equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its acceleration. This is an amazing and powerful equation used all through physics and engineering and we'll use it a lot more this semester. Net force equals mass times acceleration. And again, just to remind you, the SI units for force are Newtons. If you ever forget the force equals mass times acceleration equation, just think about the units. One Newton equals one kilogram multiplied by one meter per second squared. So that's Newton's second law of motion and his third law of motion states if a, you exert a force on a body, that body will always exert a force back upon you. So the force uh, 
of one object on another is equal and opposite to the force back on the first object. You might not believe me, that might seem counterintuitive. Try kicking a wall and see if it doesn't kick you back. No, okay, don't actually do that. But it goes to show you that there are equal and opposite forces. You push something, it's going to push you back. You might not notice it, but maybe say stand on uh, a frozen pond or on an ice rink or something. You try to push something, you'll be pushed back as well. People who have fired firearms, you feel this. As the bullet is pushed out of the gun, there's a recoil. You feel the gun being pushed back as well. And so these forces are known as action-reaction pairs. There's a force in one direction on one object and an equal and opposite force back on the first object. I noticed this a lot when I used to play baseball. When you hit a baseball, you will feel that reaction force back on your bat as you make contact with the ball. You notice it even more if you hit something larger like a softball. Or in my backyard when I was a kid, we made up this game where we used to hit small basketballs with baseball bats all the time and played a whole kind of makeup baseball game in the backyard. And hitting those uh, basketballs, especially as relatively weak young kids, we really felt the recoil of the bat as it tried to bounce back. So Newton's third law was in action even in my childhood. I loved physics from a young age. So again, applying Newton's third law, here's kind of a, a fun example to think about. All right, the earth is pulling on the apple, right? It has a weight, so therefore the earth is pulling on it. Guess what? The apple is also pulling on the earth in an equal and opposite amount. So when you think about your weight, your gravitational pull, the earth's pulling on you, and guess what? You're pulling back on the earth with the exact same amount of force. Similarly here, you see a table where the apple is pushing down on the table, and the table is pushing back up on the apple with an equal and opposite amount of force. So again, keep in mind, these are action-reaction pairs, as you can see here. But if you remove the table very quickly, you'll see that that force from the table will disappear. And then for the apple itself, its net force will be down, and it will accelerate down, even though it's pulling on the Earth. Okay, so that's Newton's third law. One more thing I wanted to just kind of point out before we wrap up this section is a common kind of misunderstanding. It seems like kind of odd, right? If for every action force there's an equal and opposite reaction force, how do you ever get a non-zero net force, right? If I, you know, push on an object and it's pushing back on me, how do I ever get a net force that's not zero? How are things ever even able to move if there's always these action-reaction pairs? Well, this is a common confusion point for people. But here, let me give you an example. So here's a guy, all right, he's going to say he's pulling, let's imagine that there's a rope here. He's pulling this box and there's a rope around the box. And so he applies a force to the box and the box applies an equal and opposite force back on him, right? So how is it that anything's ever going to move if these forces are equal and opposite? Well, what happens is if you ignore the man and just isolate the box by itself, for the box, its net force isn't dependent upon how much it's pulling on the man. It just has the force from the rope, which is from the man pulling, but it also has a friction force on the floor. And it's how those two compare to one another that determines if the box moves. So if the man pulls with a force greater than the maximum friction force, the box will start to slide. Now the amount the man pulls and the force the box pulls back on the man, those two are always gonna be the same, but the net force on the box can be non-zero because that force the equal one between the man and the box can exceed friction, in which case the box will begin to slide. So keep in mind, you have to think about objects individually when looking at their forces. And so that's what we're gonna do from here on. I'm gonna stop for now and do some different examples of how we apply Newton's three laws of motion to a series of different situations in the next video.